The fact that the mind is like a committee can be a weakness, or it can be a strength. It's a weakness when you're trying to get the mind to settle down. You have a clear idea of what you want to do, but not everybody in the mind is on board. You realize there's some free time here, and something in the mind says, well, now you can think about X. You haven't had time all day, now it's some free time to think about X. And you suddenly find yourself away from the breath, away from the meditation. Then you come back, and then there's another opinion. It's how about Y? How about Z? And if you spend your time stamping out all those different opinions, it's like playing whack-a-mole. A mole comes up out of this hole, and you whack it, and then another one comes up out of another one, you whack that. The mind never gets a chance to settle down and really be at, at ease or have any stillness. But the fact that the mind is like a committee means you have lots of different selves in there. And when an unskillful one takes over, you don't have to follow it. There's that tendency in the mind, and it's a strange tendency. And when you're working on something skillful, the mind can find all sorts of excuses not to be there, to go, not to go down that path, to go down another path. But when you get on an unskillful path, something in the mind says, well, now you're committed, you might as well follow it all the way through. You've got to switch those attitudes. And the fact that you do have other voices in the mind that can say, hey, wait a minute, this is off the track. And the realization that you don't have to identify with everybody on the committee. It's difficult because every voice in the committee sounds like you. There may be attitudes you picked up from your parents, picked up from school, picked up from the media, but you've internalized them. So every thought sounds like your thought. Every desire, your desire. But when you realize that you have a choice, and you can have other desires, other thoughts, that allows you to pull yourself out. Because otherwise you're stuck with the conundrum if you have just one self. Either the self is good or it's bad. If it's already good, then why do you need to practice? If it's already bad, how can you practice? Everything you come up with is going to be suspect. You're going to have to go for some outside help. But when you realize you've got multiple selves and they're all levels of goodness and bad, you can realize that you're here to strengthen the good ones, and starve the bad ones. That's the image the Buddha uses. He talks about starving the hindrances. Sensual desire comes up, ill will comes up, sleepiness, restlessness and anxiety, uncertainty. You try to starve them by pulling out and looking at them with appropriate attention, asking yourself, what is this? If you were to apply the Four Noble Truths or the basic distinction between skillful and unskillful, where would this mind state fall? Well, it would fall into the causes of suffering, something unskillful. In cases like that, the duty is to abandon it. Our problem is that when the hindrances come up, we don't pull out of them clean enough. And we tend to believe in them. Sensual desire says, this particular thought is really attractive. It's worth desiring. Ill will will tell you that so-and-so did something really bad and they deserve to suffer for it. They can come up with all kinds of reasons. Sleepiness comes on, there's a part of the mind that says, yes, I really do need to rest. Restless and anxiety, you feel virtuous about getting worried about things, that you really are concerned about realities. And as for uncertainty, you can find all sorts of reasons to be cynical or to not believe. 
And so it's quite a step to say, I don't have to believe these voices in the mind. I can step out of them and just look at where they're coming from and see that they're not worth going with. So we have that choice. We want to make the most of it. As for the skillful qualities to be developed, those are the factors for awakening. Mindfulness, analysis of qualities when the mind gets very clear about what's skillful and what's not skillful inside. It's followed by persistence, where you actually try to abandon what's unskillful and develop what's skillful. You see this happening in the mind where you continue with it. Keep at it until there's a sense of fullness that comes from the fact that you've been able to abandon unskillful qualities. That's the definition of the rapture that comes in the first jhana. And the rapture gets based on concentration, it gets even stronger. And then you move the mind to a, a state of calm, eventually to equanimity. Okay, you apply appropriate attention to these things, which means that you see the good things and you try to develop them, maintain them, let them grow. But it's based on the ability to step out and evaluate the voices in the mind, see which ones are worth going with, which ones are not. And because you have so many voices, you can take the good ones and you strengthen them. And they become your power, they become your strength on the path. Because you need that strength. We get encouragement from our teachers, we get encouragement from our fellow practitioners. But there comes a point where you really have to depend on yourself. You have to find the resources of appropriate attention inside you. This is when the practice really becomes yours. And John Fu noted when I first stayed with him, we'd have a group meditation every evening. He'd always encourage me, when you go back to your hut, meditate some more. As he said, his experience was that with people who would sit through the group sit, and that was the extent of their meditation, didn't go very far. It was the self-starters, the ones who realized, we're not doing this just to fit in with a group. We're doing this because there's suffering in the mind, and something needs to be done about it. And this is the best thing to do about it. And sort of a resistance there is in the mind, whatever voices say no. You have your reasons to say yes. It says you resist the temptation just to go back and chill out for the rest of the evening. That you learn how to deal with your defilements. You learn how to argue with them. So you don't give in to them all the time. This is an important part of the meditation, is the fact that you're doing the work. They do have these electronic devices now that will either give you biofeedback so you get an idea of when you've got the right brain waves, or they will actually change your brain waves for you and say it's a great shortcut to awakening. Well, it's a shortcut maybe to concentration. But when you're not doing the work, you're not getting any understanding. It's when you actually fight off a defilement. It's actually when you get the mind to settle in and see all the different fabrications that go into getting the mind to settle in, either in terms of the three fabrications or the five aggregates. You see this as, as activities and you master them yourself. That's when you gain insight. That's when you gain the discernment that allows you to be free. Otherwise, you're just coasting along, plugging in, and getting a buzz. And that's it. No understanding. Because you're not making any of the choices. And the voices in the mind can continue chattering along as they did in the past. The 
is when you learn how to argue with them, the unskillful ones. Learn how to give some encouragement to skillful ones. That's when you begin sorting things out in the mind. You gain some understanding of how the mind works. Because it's how the mind works has been going on in ignorance for so long, and that's why we suffer. And here we're trying to bring knowledge to that process. And the knowledge comes from getting your hands dirty. In other words, actually doing the work. Meditating on days when the meditation is not going well and not giving up. Meditating at times when, say, early in the morning you get up and you really want to continue lying down for a while, but there's a voice inside that says, No, you don't gain awakening by lying down and indulging in the pleasure of lying down. You gain awakening by getting up and you actually follow through. That's when you made a step in the right direction, and you've begun to train the members of the Committee of the Mind to actually become your friends, the ones that are really your enemies, the ones that don't have any idea about or any concern about long-term happiness. You can put them out to pasture. You can retire them, and you work with the ones that are determined. Realize you've suffered enough, and this is the way out. So don't get discouraged when the unskillful members of the mind take over. Find resources inside yourself to say, I've got to figure out the way around these people. John Mahabo has an image. He says, even when you lose to them, you can still, still curse them. It's okay to be angry about the fact that you're not as skillful as you'd like to be. After all, the Buddha himself said the key to his awakening was discontent with his skillful qualities. So learn how to nurture that attitude in a healthy way. And you find that there will be times when you win, and you get that much closer to realizing that maybe you too can find an end to suffering. So learn how to aim high. And as you take this higher point of view, then you look at the Committee of the Mind, you get a clearer idea of who needs to be removed and who needs to be promoted. And it's simply a matter of figuring out the politics inside so you can actually do that, get the right people in charge. But you're the one who has to do the work. Even the Buddha said that all he could do was point out the way. But the fact that we have someone who has pointed out the way based on his experience that's a big leg up right there. <laughs>